as from one trader to the next. And yet, oranges were transacted in an invisible market. That is a risk transfer mechanism. When he was chairman of the exchange, Leo Malamud took that idea with oranges and applied it to financial assets in a contract that became known as a derivative. It was a revolutionary idea. The board of directors looked at me as if I was half crazy. What do you mean? At the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Pork Belly Exchange? You've got to be crazy, Malamud. You're going to take this exchange and blow it up. If you're worried that a financial asset like a currency might suddenly move down, you can buy a derivative that pays you if that happens. Everyone in the world uses one or another form of financial derivatives to ensure the risks that they have. Derivatives are so useful they move beyond the mercantile exchange and with less oversight take on complex new forms. There are even some created to ensure the risks of issuing millions of home mortgages. But as all these different risks grow, someone has to measure them. At modern temples of finance, the atmosphere is less Chicago mercantile and more like academia. No wonder. The average trader here is likely to have a graduate degree in math. The culture of trading has changed. When I started in this business, which wasn't that long ago, in, in 1992, there was a lot of screaming and yelling on the trading floors. People were throwing phones. Today, you go out on the trading floor, and it's relatively quiet. There's a lot of tapping of computer keys, and it's a different type of person involved in trading. These traders are called quants because they use equations and statistics to quantify their risks mathematically. Only then do they program their computers to make trades. The financial markets are now dominated by the highly mathematical approach of the quants, one that's been designed to ensure risks are assessed rationally and scientifically. There's still aspects of trading that are an art and not a science. What's changed is that there are now a lot of aspects that are, are treated as a science, and that's new over the last 20 years. A quant will troll through a tons and tons of data looking for patterns, and they're crunching the numbers all day and, and trying to in, improve performance. These two key innovations, derivatives to manage risk and mathematics to measure it, convince many that markets are efficient, making bubbles and crashes a thing of the past. If you believe that, you can believe that pigs will fly. When I first heard economists coming out with that idea, I assumed that they were very badly informed, often their ivory towers. Jeremy Grantham is a highly successful investor. For the last 40 years, he's made his money by spotting bubbles and betting the prices will return to normal. We found 27 bubbles. Grantham believes bubbles are inevitable and have a predictable rhythm. It's euphoria causing the price to go up and realism causing it to fall back. And then eventually, unrealistic panic as it begins to feed on itself and the lemmings head in the opposite direction. At Chapman University in California, this cycle is studied by Vernon Smith. A lot of economists do not like the idea of bubbles because they're so hard to understand. In this experiment, Smith wants to see what happens when students compete to earn money on a simulated trading floor. Participating in a trading experiment? It's not a classroom setting. It, it's a setting in which your job is to make as much money as you possibly can. Will be paid based on the dividends that you have earned. Plus any if they play the game well, they could earn hundreds of dollars. This is real money, serious money. Each of them has been given an imaginary financial asset to trade. And right from the start, they're told to be careful because the asset will decline in value over time. By the end of the game, it will be worth nothing. The asset will live exactly 15 periods of trading. And the question is whether the, this will determine the prices at which they exchange or whether the prices at which they trade deviate from that. Okay, the experiment has begun.
On the screen, they see the prices the other traders are offering to sell or buy at. And they also see the value of the asset as it relentlessly declines. Shown here is a dashed black line heading downwards. As prices rise, they reach the actual value of the asset. And something strange happens. Everyone begins to take risks. So you notice the price has been racing up. In the hope of making profits, they now trade high above the real value. Uh, there's quite a frenzy, way above fundamental value. In the flurry of buying, the students are now ignoring the fact that the asset will soon be worthless. We're in uh, period 10. And at the end of period 15, these assets are worth nothing. As the end approaches, the price remains way above the real value. The graph has taken on a classic bubble shape. And when the players try to get out, no one wants to buy. Instead of earning hundreds of dollars, the students watch the graph collapse, leaving them with next to nothing. This experiment suggests bubbles may be part of the fabric of financial markets. We've done hundreds of them now, and with all kinds of different subjects. I went to Chicago and I recruited some over-the-counter uh, securities traders, put them in an experiment. They gave us a magnificent bubble. It's a bubble where prices go up and then suddenly plummet. How could such a simple pattern have brought us so close to economic catastrophe. In 2005, as housing prices grow, the mechanisms that rational economists count on to keep the markets safe become part of the problem. Major financial institutions issue billions of dollars worth of derivatives to protect mortgage lenders against home loan defaults. And every time you created one, you could make 6% of the total value you created. This was like a gold mine. These derivatives are traded and their price soars. And suddenly they have become the 21st century equivalent of tulip bulbs. Within a few years, $60 trillion is riding on them. All this is fine as long as the quants are calculating risk properly. But their mathematical model assumes the prices in markets are always correct. It was assuming that house prices would keep going up. It was assuming that very few people would default on some very risky loans. It was, it was essentially assuming that there was no more economic cycle. Notice all those for sale signs out there on homes the owners just can't... When home loan. values fall, the model the breaks down. Scenario, if fact, the price of derivatives plunges, leaving financial institutions with billions of dollars of debt. Banks couldn't sell these things at any price, so effectively, their price was nothing. Years of a financial meltdown on Wall Street. On the eve of the crash, there was a whole intellectual edifice built on the assumptions of rational decision making. The only bank in the red right now, Bear Stearns, writing. It's really hard to say that the market is rational and perfect and knows what it's doing when it's clearly capable of freezing up and ceasing to function. As fear grips the market, financial firms pull back their money blood on the floor at the end of trading on and refuse to lend to each other. It has been a roller Uncertainty leads to something that looks very much like panic. You can give it the charged word panic if you like, but in my view, it's just a change in taste. Half a trillion dollars in mortgage investments have gone bad. Emotions is how human beings expected. make rational decisions. You know, it's, it, when that line is coming, it's important that you feel some adrenaline and some fear, and that's how you make the rational decision to run like heck in the opposite direction. The Dow tumbled 240 points while the Nasdaq sank. You, know, you, you take this, we have another 30 years like we had the, in the past, including this recession. This would be a great achievement for the world. Those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions are in a state of shock disbelief. We think we've got a good quantitative framework which takes care of all the risks, but it's missing something. It's a case where people believe the theory too much and they were willing to make huge bets. 
based on a theory that really wasn't right. This Nova program is available on DVD at shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.